everyone. Um, thank you for showing up. Um, I know it's a long weekend, um, so I appreciate you being here, especially on such a nice day. Um, for those of you who, um, if your IAs are here, so Laura, Andrew, Josiah, and Sam are here with the exams that I see. Um, so if you want to, you can pick up your exam, uh, no, your, exam your quiz two from them after class. Um, and if your IAs are not here, um, they will have them at their office hours next week, or you can email them about trying to arrange something ahead of time. Um, okay, so today we are going to discuss the steps of cell division. Um, we left off last class talking about the eukaryotic cell cycle, the key steps um, in this process, how cells that are continuing to cycle, continuing to divide, will um, re-enter G1 to begin new rounds of uh, cell division. And for many of the cells in our body, um, these are cells that are quiescent or post-mitotic, meaning they're no longer going to divide. And so those cells will kind of shunt off here, go and exit the cell cycle into what's called the G0 state. As we talked about, there's specific events that occur in each phase of the cell cycle. And we talked just in very broad terms about how progression through these different stages is gated and regulated by the activity of a set of kinases called cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs. And just to remind you, these CDKs are not active on their own, but when they become bound to cyclins, that activates their kinase um, domain, and they can go on and phosphorylate different targets in the cell, including transcription factors if they want to regulate gene expression, including uh, proteins that are already in the cytosol, and the phosphorylation events will, rec will regulate the activity of those downstream effectors. And so at each stage, at each transition, there are different cyclin CDK complexes that regulate effectors in order to promote the events of that particular stage. Okay. So today we're going to be talking only about the very last stage of the cell cycle, mitosis or M phase. And right, the goal of mitosis is to take the DNA that, that has been replicated during S phase and to equally partition it between two daughter cells. And da daughter cells is just the term that's used in the field to describe the two cells that are created through cell division. We're going to cover each of these steps, but the key events are going to be chromosome condensation, spindle assembly. So this is um, creation of the microtubule-based machine that's actually going to pull the chromosomes apart. We're going to discuss chromosome alignment in the spindle, and then how the spindle regulates separation of the chromosomes, and then ultimately how the cell is able to pinch off into two daughters, so separation at the end. And the important thing to know is that, well, maybe like the most important thing to know is that this process is super highly regulated because cells need to um, accurately partition chromosomes each and every time, right? So we talked about how we start from a single cell, right? And our bodies now have trillions of cells. These were created through cell division. And the only reason why we're here is because each and every time these cells divided, they do so accurately. So at each step here, there are mechanisms in place to ensure that chromosomes are going to be equally partitioned. And as we'll get into a little bit more next week, this is really important because if you missegregate your chromosomes, if you don't partition them equally through mitosis, this can lead to many different types of pathologies, including most famously cancer. So when you look at tumor cells, for example, they often have abnormal numbers of chromosomes. And here is a movie showing, you can see if you follow the arrows, these are chromosomes that are not being segregated properly during cell division. And this will result in a phenotype called aneuploidy. 
So aneuploidy is just having an abnormal number of chromosomes, and this can come from gaining an extra chromosome, from losing one, from fragmenting chromosomes, so you just have little pieces of them. And here is um, an example of what a, you know, what's called a karyotype of a tumor cell might look like. As we talked about in a normal cell, and as I'm sure you've heard in your other biology classes, we are primarily diploid, based um, on diploid cells, meaning we have two copies of every chromosome. But if you look at the um, chromosomal complement of tumor cells, you can see all sorts of different abnormalities, including loss of whole chromosomes, as I mentioned, addition of extra copies, um, fusion events, and these can be driven by problems in mitosis. So let's start by talking about where, where the cell is at before you enter M phase. So as we talked about, during S phase, the DNA is going to be replicated. Um, we have homologous chromosomes, right? each of which is going to be duplicated. And then the terminology here is that each copy of this duplicated chromosome is called a chromatid. So these are uh, what are called sister chromatids. And they are connected by a specific region of, the, of each chromosome called the centromere. They're, or they're connected at the centromere, I should say. Um, so these sister chromatids should be identical because one of them was used as the template to synthesize the other. And as we'll talk about, this centromeric region is going to be really important during mitosis for chromosome alignment and chromosome segregation. They are, I should also say, because this protein will come up later, the way that they're actually tethered is that there is a protein called cohesin. Um, so just like the name kind of sounds like, the name sounds like cohesion. <laughs> the, the cohesin protein is what is keeping these sister chromatids together at the centromeres. The other thing I want to highlight about the centromeres, which will be important for mitosis later, is that as you guys have heard in your other classes, DNA is wrapped around protein complexes called, um, well, collectively they're called nucleosomes, but those nucleosomes are made up of histone proteins. And so histones are loaded onto DNA and DNA is wrapped around them. At the centromere, at the specific site on each chromosome, there is a particular variant um, an H3 variant, a histone 3 variant, that is loaded into the nucleosome. And this is called SEMP-A. And as we'll see, SEMP-A marks the centromere as a very important site on the chromosome to assemble um, protein machinery that's required for chromosome alignment. Okay, so SEMP-A is typically the nucleosomes all along the chromosome will have histone 3 in them. But specifically at the centromere, there is a histone 3 variant called SEMP-A that's loaded instead. Okay. The other thing that has to happen, in addition to duplicating your chromosomes, you have to duplicate centrioles. So we talked about centrioles briefly within the context of the microtubule lecture, lecture 17 here. This is a refresher from that slide deck. Um, so just to remind you, in most kind of cultured cell types or proliferative cell types, the microtubule cytoskeleton is organized by a structure called the centrosome. And this is true both in interphase, so in G1, S, and G2. And then the centrosomes play really critical roles in organizing microtubules during mitosis. In mitosis, these centrosomes are sometimes referred to, as is in this diagram, as spindle poles. And that's because this microtubule structure that's created to align those duplicated chromosomes and separate them equally into the daughters, that's called the mitotic spindle. So in interphase, the cells have one centrosome. And in order to prepare for mitosis, where you're going to need two centrosomes, the centrioles have to be duplicated. So as a reminder, um, once again, this concept was introduced in the microtubule lecture, but a centrosome is comprised of two centrioles, 
called A Mother and a Daughter. And then these centrioles recruit lots and lots of other proteins, including that gamma turk microtubule nucleating complex. And this is what allows the centrioles and the centrosome as a whole to function as a microtubule organizing center. So we're not going to go into the molecular regulators of this process, although it's a very interesting process. Um, but I think it's sufficient to say that during S phase, each of these centrioles is going to kind of nucleate a new one off of its um, structure. So both the mother and the daughter will create a new centriole. And in that way, you can go from having one centrosome to having two that will function as the spindle poles. As we'll see, at the end of mitosis, at the end of this process, each of the two daughters will inherit one centrosome made up of two centrioles. And in that way, they're kind of reset back to the G1 state. So those two kind of key duplication events or replication events have to be done before the cell goes into mitosis. Obviously, if you don't replicate your chromosomes, right, you won't be able to partition them equally between two daughters. And similarly, if you have defects in central duplication, this will often, not, not always, but will often result in problems in chromosome segregation in mitosis. So here are the key stages of mitosis that we'll be talking about. Once again, just to remind you, interphase refers to the three previous steps, G1, S, and G2, as the cell is preparing itself to, um, to undergo cell division. And then we'll treat each of these uh, separately. But once again, this, these are the five key things that have to happen during mitosis. The chromosomes will condense, and the spindle will begin to assemble in what's called prophase. The chromosomes will begin to align um, in prometaphase and will be fully aligned by the end of metaphase. Then when chromosomes are going to be separated um, into two daughters, that is during anaphase. And then finally, the last two steps are telophase and cytokinesis which um, allow the chromosomes to become repackaged in the nuclear envelope and allow the two daughter cells to pinch off from one another. So we will go through each of these um, separately. So I'm trying to provide as much detail as possible um, to help you guys uh, remember this material. Um, so the, the key things that have to happen during prophase are you have to start to build these structures that are going to be used to segregate the chromosomes, and you also have to condense the chromosomes down. So starting with chromosome condensation, right? the chromosomes, yes, in interphase, DNA is wrapped around um, nucleosomes, and those can also be compacted. right? So you're not just going from a completely uncompacted to a completely compacted state. But during the process of chromosome segregation, the, the DNA is compacted up to 10,000-fold down in length. And this is so that you can, you can easily move these chromosomes um, in the mitotic spindle and to separate them. Right? If you just had floppy pieces of DNA, then it would be really hard to move them accurately without them all getting tangled on each other. So this condensation is required for accurate chromosome segregation. This is mediated by, um, by proteins called condensins. Okay? So once again, the name is indicating what it does. And what these do, very kind of a simplistic level, is that at the onset of mitosis, CDK1 is going to phosphorylate and activate condensin. And condensin will help to stabilize DNA loops and in this way compact the DNA structure down. So condensin will become loaded, creating all of these loops. And this gives rise to kind of the characteristic image that many of us have of human chromosomes, that X shape. Um, those are condensed chromosomes, right? And 
that's mediated through condensin. The other thing that has to happen on the DNA is that you have to start to assemble a large protein complex called the kinetochore. The kinetochore is going to recognize that histone variant that I talked about earlier, SEMP-A. So SEMP-A is a marker that's used on the chromosomes to say, assemble this structure here. Okay. Um, and as we'll get into a little bit more detail later, the purpose of this protein complex, which is made up of like up to 100 proteins, depending on the species, so it's quite complicated, but the key, the key function of the kinetochore is to link the chromosome on which it was assembled, shown here in blue, link it to microtubules in the mitotic spindle. And as we'll see, this interaction is really important for aligning the microtubules, and the, I mean, sorry, aligning the chromosomes, and then pulling them apart at the end of mitosis. So this structure is a very, very vital one. The other thing that has to be assembled during prophase is that mitotic spindle. So this is what's called the centrial um, cycle or centrial duplication cycle. I won't be asking you about the specific regulators of centrial duplication. But as we just talked about, during the process of moving through the cell cycle, the cell is going to take one centrosome and create now two. And those will begin to nucleate a lot of microtubules as the cell goes into mitosis. And that will create this structure called the mitotic spindle. So as these microtubules are being nucleated via that gamma-Turk complex that we talked about, that gamma-tubulin ring complex, the centrosomes are going to start to move apart from each other so that they can form two opposing spindle poles. And the way this is controlled is through the action of microtubule-based motors. Right? So when we talked about microtubule motors before, we talked about how they're protein machines that use ATP to walk along microtubules. And in the case of spindle pole separation, these kinesins, right, microtubule motors, can cross-link two filaments and then slide them away from each other, pushing the spindle poles apart. So you can imagine here, the head domains of each of these kinesins right, are going to be bound to two different microtubules. Because this kinesin is a plus N directed motor, it's going to slide the microtubules in opposing directions when they're bound by um, two centrosomes. And in that way, the centrosomes will move apart in order to create the spindle. Are there any questions here about building those particular structures? So we talked about how chromosomes need to be condensed, how kinetochores need to be assembled on centromeric DNA, and then how the spindle has to start to assemble by nucleating a lot of microtubules, and then having the two centrosomes move apart to make the two opposing spindle poles. Any questions? Okay, so the next step is, um, in some textbooks you'll see it as just prophase go right into metaphase. Um, the book we're using does talk explicitly about prometaphase. And in this stage, um, the nuclear envelope is gonna break down, and then the chromosomes are going to be captured by the microtubules, and that's the term that's used. So to Call your mind, recall back to right before, well, kind of right before the midterm and immediately after in those two lectures, we discussed um, the nuclear envelope within the context of movement of proteins through these nuclear pore complexes, right? So just to remind you, the DNA in your cells is contained in the nucleus, and the nucleus has this two um, membrane. The, nucleus, the nuclear envelope um, has two membranes, an inner nuclear membrane and an outer nuclear membrane. 
And along the inner nuclear membrane is this intermediate filament network call, um, that's made up of proteins called lamins. Right? We talked about that when we talked about intermediate filaments in the class. So during mitosis, the spindle microtubules need to be able to interact with the chromosomes. So for that to happen, at least in our cells, you have to get the chromosomes out of the nucleus, essentially. You have to be able, um, you have to have those microtubules in the cytosol be able to make contact with the kinetochores. So in our cells and in many eukaryotes, although not all, the nuclear envelope will be disassembled during this prometaphase um, stage. And once again, this is an event that's driven by CDK activity. So CDK1, which is the mitotic CDK, will phosphorylate lamins. And when it does so, that essentially causes them to um, depolymerize either into soluble monomers in the cytosol, or in the case of lamin Bs, these dissociated lamins will be enclosed in membrane vesicles during mitosis. And you can see that here. So this is immunofluorescence, right? We're looking at reporters for um, lamin A protein and for DNA. And you can see that lamin A nicely um, marks the nuclear envelope in interphase. But as the cell is going into um, prometaphase and metaphase, this lamin A becomes kind of diffuse, so that means the lamin A is being disassembled, right? And by the time the cell is going to try to align the chromosomes, that nuclear envelope has been completely broken down. And so without this structural support that's provided by the lamins, the membranes will start to retract. And as a reminder, once again, the outer nuclear membrane is continuous with the ER membrane. And so as these membranes retract, you're going to get kind of um, that nuclear envelope is going to kind of retract into the ER during mitosis. Right? So now the chromosomes are free in the cytosol and can interact with the microtubules of the mitotic spindle. So once the chromosomes have been freed, now they will be captured by these microtubules. So just as a reminder, microtubules are really dynamic, right? We talked about how their plus ends in particular um, undergo this behavior called dynamic instability. So these microtubules are being nucleated by the centrosomes, which means their plus ends are going to be outward. And so these plus ends are undergoing dynamic instability, and they're constantly growing and shrinking. And they're performing what's called kind of the search and capture model <laughs> of um, where the growth and shrinkage of these microtubules is basically the way that they find the kinetochores um, along, the along the chromosomes in order to attach um, and tether the chromosomes to the mitotic spindle. Okay. So you have to imagine in real time, kind of, these chromosomes are floating around in the middle of the spindle. These spindle microtubules are growing and shrinking, and occasionally they will interact with the chromosomes, and when they do so, they will bind and kind of be captured. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. And then don't worry about the specific motors that are involved in this process. But as microtubules are capturing the chromosomes, it is really, once again, the action of these microtubule motors that's going to traffic the chromosomes to the midpoint of the spindle. So then once the chromosomes have started to be captured, the next stage is that you the cell wants to align all those chromosomes along what's sometimes referred to as the metaphase plate. And that just basically means they want to move all the chromosomes directly into the center of this microtubule spindle structure. 
So in a typical um, mammalian or, yeah, I guess mammalian spindle, um, you have different populations of microtubules. Okay? You have what are called astral microtubules. These are microtubules, so I should say, all of these that are being referred to in this diagram are being nucleated by the centrosomes, and so all of them have their minus ends at the centrosome. What's different about them is where their plus ends are. So astromicrotubules will kind of be nucleated and have their plus ends contacting the periphery of the cell. And as we'll talk about, those, that population of microtubules will become important during the process of chromosome separation and to help position this gigantic spindle structure. Then there are kineticore microtubules, sometimes called K-fibers. These are the microtubules that interact with that protein complex at centromeres, the kineticore, and help to capture the, uh, the chromosomes. And then there are also polar microtubules. These are, have their plus ends directed towards the midline of the spindle as well, but the plus ends are not directly interacting with the uh, chromosomes. Instead, these kind of provide structural support to the spindle, and these will be really important during the process of separation of the chromosomes in anaphase. Okay. So during this process of chromosome alignment in metaphase, the key thing is that kineticores um, on these sister chromatids need to be attached to opposing spindle poles because ultimately you're gonna to wanna to pull them in opposite directions, right? So the key thing that the cell is trying to do is make sure that the kineticores are attached to microtubules um, from opposing sides of the cell. I do wanna make a note here that, um, this is something that my lab works on, so I feel obligated to say something about this, but um, this structure, this large structure, the mitotic spindle, the position of this whole thing often has to be regulated in the cell as well. So in most cells, you're gonna to wanna to center the spindle, but there's specific kind of stem cell divisions where the cell wants to move the spindle to one side or the other. And the way this works is via interactions of these astromicrotubules with, once again, a microtubule motor that's tethered to the cell cortex. So this motor is dynein. This is, once again, a minus N directed motor. The minus ends are near the centrosome. So when dynein is tethered here, it's gonna to try to pull microtubules and walk towards the minus end. But because dynein itself can't walk, it's anchored there, it's gonna just pull that whole structure toward it. And that is one of the mechanisms that's used to help center or position the spindle. So during metaphase, as I mentioned earlier, the key thing that has to happen as these chromosomes are aligning along the midline of, this, of the mitotic spindle is that kineticores, shown here in orange, need to become, the kineticores of the sister chromatids need to become captured by microtubules from opposing spindle poles. And those spindle poles here are represented by these green circles. Okay, so this is not to scale, <laughs> but this, this green box here shows you what the cell is trying to do. But in the process of making these attachments, right, I talked about the search and capture model where these microtubules are growing and shrinking and they're just gonna interact with kineticores, right? And sometimes they're gonna interact with the wrong one. So there are other types of attachment that can occur and all of these have to be corrected before the cell will move into anaphase. And the reason is, right, so ultimately, these microtubules will attach to the kineticores, and then during anaphase, as we'll talk about, they're going to physically pull sister chromatids apart. But if these have, you can imagine then, if you had a kineticore that was attached to microtubules from both poles, then when it comes time to pull them apart, these chromosomes will not be able to be pulled accurately to one side of the cell or the other. Um, and this could result to 
what's called chromosomal instability resulting in aneuploidy, that condition I told you about earlier that is a hallmark of cancer. So to ensure that all the kinetochores have these proper attachments, there are specific mechanisms in the cell that sense when attachments have been made that are correct. And this is a pathway, well, I should say here, this pathway is called the spindle assembly checkpoint, or SAC. The name is potentially a bit confusing <laughs> because spindle assembly checkpoint sounds like it has something to do directly with assembling the mitotic spindle. But actually what this is referring to is proper attachment of these spindle microtubules to the correct kinetochores. Okay. This is a very, in well, I, I personally think this is a very, very interesting topic. How do cells actually know um, that these kinetochores are properly attached? Um, in this class, we're not going to go into detail about the mechanisms that are used, although I'd be happy to talk to people afterwards or during office hours if this sounds interesting to you. But I do want to just quickly say, um, in general terms, how the cell is able to sense either unattached kinetochores or kinetochores that are attached to microtubules from two different poles. So monotelic attachments are what is shown up here on the top left. And this is the case where one of the kinetochores is attached, but the other one is not. And in most simplistic terms, these unattached kinetochores are recognized by a specific protein complex that blocks the activity of a ubiquitin ligase called APC. And as we'll see, APC activity is what triggers entry into anaphase. So what this means is that as long as kinetochores remain unattached, then um, the activity of this APC protein complex will remain blocked, and the cell will remain in metaphase. Right? So that's one mechanism that the cell uses to make sure that all kinetochores are attached to microtubules. But then what about these other kinds? There's scintillic and myrotelic attachments. And these are cases where either kinetochore, both kinetochores are attached to microtubules from the same spindle pole, or in the case of myrotelic attachments where, um, well, this shows both, but this kinetochore here on the right is attached to microtubules coming from both spindle poles. So how does the cell recognize these? Well, a clue for this is actually shown in the schematic here, which is that when, when these kinetochores make proper attachments, this actually puts tension on the, the, on the sister chromatids. So when you have microtubules attached properly to the kinetochores, they will exert a force and pull slightly these kinetochores apart. And that is actually a signal that the cell uses to say, we are attached properly. You can see here in the scintillic and myrotelic attachments, because the microtubules um, are not kind of only attaching to kinetochores on one side or the other, there's no tension across this um, pair of chromatids. So when the chrom when the um, I didn't introduce NDC80 earlier. I will box this and update the thing so that you don't have to know about NDC80, but um, NDC80 is the critical kinetochore protein that, um, that mediates attachment to microtubules, and it's really kind of phosphorylation of this protein which um, is used in this tension sensing mechanism. But I will box this in yellow and re-upload the slide deck. So overall, right, the key, of, the key step that's occurring in metaphase, as chromosomes are moving to the center of the spindle, is that um, you want to ensure that the kinetochores have properly attached to microtubules from opposing poles. So once that takes place, once everything is properly aligned, then what people say is the spindle assembly checkpoint has been satisfied. 
and then the cell will move into anaphase. So, right, we, these chromosomes so far, they're attached to microtubules, but these sisters are also still attached to each other. So in order to pull them apart to opposing sides of the cell, you have to cleave um, the protein cohesin, which is keeping these centromeres together. And this cleavage event is catalyzed by um, kind of the critical protein that regulates entry into anaphase, which is called APC. This an is, oh, so APC stands for anaphase promoting complex. Okay. And so what this does, I think this, well, I provide two schematics, kind of the big picture view here, which maybe will help you later on. Um, but this is kind of a more molecular view of what's happening here. So you have these cohesins, which at the centromere are keeping the chromatids together. As APC, as the anaphase promoting complex is activated, it's going to target a protein called securin for degradation. Securin before anaphase onset is bound to a protein called separase, which is being kept inactive. So as the cell is going into anaphase, as the spindle assembly checkpoint has been satisfied, APC, the anaphase promoting complex, is going to target securin for degradation. That's going to activate separase. And once again, the name here is indicating what the activity of the protein is. Separase is going to cleave the cohesins at the centromere so that they are now separated from each other. And this is vital so that they can be pulled to opposing poles. Right. So once um, cohesin has been cleaved by separase, now these dynamic microtubules are going to start to pull the chromosomes apart. Once again, this is driven <laughs> um, by the dynamic nature of the microtubules and also by specific microtubule motors. For example, kinesin-13 is a motor protein that actually depolymerizes a microtubule. And so these kinetochores can actually remain attached to depolymerizing microtubules. They can kind of keep hold of them. And so as these microtubules are being depolymerized, as they are shrinking, the kinetochores will remain attached, and the chromosomes will then be pulled towards the spindle poles. At the same time, kinesin 15, or sorry, this is also a typo, it should be kinesin 5. Um, kinesin 5 is going to slide these polar microtubules away from each other. And that is going to cause the spindle poles to move farther apart. Right? So the chromosomes are being pulled to the spindle poles, and the spindle poles themselves are being pulled, are being pushed farther apart. And then once again, the activity of that minus N motor at the cortex, dynene, that's pulling on the microtubules, once again, helping to move the spindle poles farther away from each other. So that by the end of anaphase, um, even though it does not necessarily look like it from <laughs> this immunofluorescence image, the chromosomes have been um, pulled to the two ends of the cell. And now the cell is ready to reform the nuclear envelope on the around the chromosomes and also to assemble um, this actin based structure called the contractile ring, which is used to actually pinch off the two daughters. Okay. So this is, um, once again, a cytoskeleton-based structure. In this case, we're talking about actin, not microtubules. The assembly of this is somewhat complicated and involved, but essentially a band of actin will begin to be formed around the midpoint of that spindle, or where the spindle was. So once you get to this stage in telophase and cytokinesis, 
the chromosomes, right, are now at opposing poles. And so if you assemble this contractile ring at the center of the cell, um, you can make sure that the chromosomes end up where they're supposed to end up. Assembly of this actin structure is dependent on um, a GTPase called Rho A. So we talked about Rho GTPases when we talked about cell migration. But in this case, Rho A is going to stimulate formin-mediated actin nucleation. As a reminder, formin nucleates kind of long filaments of actin. So in this case, these long filaments are around the periphery of the cell in this ring structure. At the same time, the rho GTPase is also going to stimulate the activity of the F-actin motor, myosin, myosin 2 in particular. We talked about myosin 2 within the context of contraction of your muscles, right? So myosin 2 is a contractile motor. Um, and so there's myosin 2 all around this ring. And as the myosin 2 becomes active, it's going to ratchet this ring closed. Um, and by doing so, we'll actually pinch off the two daughters from each other. So this is, I think, a good schematic that will be useful in thinking about how the cell cycle is regulated. I do want to close this loop, right? We talked about how um, CDK activity is important for regulating the transitions between different phases of the cell cycle. And when the cell is exiting mitosis, it's going right, to go, basically go back into G1 or G0. And so it's going to want to degrade all the remaining cyclins to reset the cell for another round of potentially um, movement through this cycle. So that APC ubiquitin ligase that I talked about, which targets securin for degradation, that also degrades the mitotic cyclins so that all the cyclins are wiped out from the cell. And now the cell is back into G1 and is ready to then undergo waves of cyclin CDK activity in order to progress through this again if, it's, if it has the right conditions to do so. So this was then the, the GIF that I had at the beginning of the last lecture. And I hope as we look at this now, you might be able to see the different stages of mitosis. So it's kind of long. I'll wait till it loops back again. All right, so at the beginning, you're going to see chromosome condensation occurring um, and nuclear envelope breakdown, yada, yada, yada. OK, 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 OK. <laughs> that was really dragged out on the end. <laughs> OK, the chromosomes are condensing. The mitotic spindle is being um, created. These chromosomes have to then make it to the metaphase plate. During this whole time here, the microtubules are trying to make proper attachments with the kinetochores. And once that's been satisfied, the chromosomes will be pulled to opposite poles. The poles will move apart. And then you assemble the contractile ring, which is not shown in this movie, because this is showing microtubules, not actin. Um, but in that final set, that step, the contractile ring will ratchet closed in order to pinch off the two membranes from each other and create two daughter cells from one. So with that, um, that covers basically the entirety of the eukaryotic cell cycle. And next week, we will on, we don't have class on Monday, as I'm sure everyone knows. Um, but on Wednesday, we'll talk about other checkpoints that operate that are particularly important when thinking about cancer. And then at the end of the week, we'll move into more cancer mechanisms before heading into our final week 10. So everyone have a nice holiday weekend, and I'll see you all next week.